Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to room 203. Personally, I think this is the best room, but you know. <laughs> if you didn't get to catch me earlier, I'm Sebastian, a designer advocate from Berlin, Germany, and I couldn't be more thrilled to be with all of you today. Whether you're in person or joining virtually, I hope you all had a, were able to enjoy a lunch break or are still eating, as I see some people, and, meet, <laughs> and met new Figma friends or catch up with some of the OGs. If you're here in person and need help finding your way around, look for a friendly face wearing a blue config tee. We literally have hundreds of Figma employees who have traveled from near and far to help create an exceptional experience for you all. And if you're joining us virtually, join the conversation anywhere on the interwebs where you might be, using the hashtag config2023. Next up, we have a dynamic duo to talk about the perceived impact of AI from a research and societal lens and how we can navigate forward. Jane Davis gets honest with us about AI. She'll talk us through the good, but also the not so great. We'll hear a little about the research she, she's done to help figure out what the best practices in AI are, and she'll leave us with some suggestions on how we can really get the most out of it. Everyone, please well, give a warm welcome to Jane Davis. Joining Great, Great Question, I ran the UX research and content design teams at Zoom during the pandemic. I uh, spent time leading UX research and content design for Zapier and ran the growth research team for Dropbox. So I spent... <laughs> I'm glad I've got a fan. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in my career thinking about how to help teams and organizations adapt their practices to technological shifts, whether it's leading through the pandemic or in the face of new technology. And I'm here today to talk to you about how we lead in the face of new technology and some of the best practices that we, as practitioners of research and design, can take with us. And the real reason I took the job at Great Question was so I could do research projects like the one I'm going to talk about today, where I get to go in depth with practitioners of our crafts to learn from them how we should be thinking about facing our future. So, AI has a lot in common with magic tricks. It's where the name of this talk comes from. We're gonna start with our long rope. I just wanna open with a confession, and that is, I'm not actually a huge fan of AI. Please don't tell anyone outside of this room and the extremely large live stream that we're doing right now. <laughs> but truly, I'm not. I think there are actually a lot of problems with AI. And I want to start this talk by acknowledging those and getting into how we move forward in the face of that knowledge. At its absolute worst, AI does all of these things. It devalues our creative work. It fails to properly credit where the work is coming from and from whence it's derived. It discourages actual learning. This is one of my favorite findings from this. I did a bunch of secondary literature review and I found a study on GitHub's Copilot that said that people were actually getting worse at coding because they couldn't understand, because the AI assistant couldn't tell them how those decisions were getting made or why it was recommending certain lines of code. And it produces unrealistic expectations. I'm pretty sure that someone in this room, if not several of you, have heard from an executive or someone else at your company who's like, can't you just throw that into mid-journey? Can't we just use ChatGPT to write that for us? No, we cannot. And on top of all of those downsides, there's this. It's often just bad. This is from Janelle Shane, one of my favorite thinkers in the space. And she does a lot of work to help probe the bounds of what AI can do. This is, as you can see, quite obviously, ASCII art of a running unicorn. 
and I think we can all agree that ChatGPT nailed it. On the other hand, this is an exceptional advice for how to approach your next performance review, so I want you all to take that with you out of this talk. Okay. I have talked uh, a lot of smack about AI as the beginning of this AI talk. So what are we actually doing in this room? Why am I talking to you today? Why am I excited about AI? What do I think the opportunity is? First, I want to start with some good news, bad news, because the whole point of this talk is to find the space in between the hype and the doom scrolling where we can have an actual progressive conversation about how we should think about AI. If you're feeling concerned because you haven't been using AI in your practice, because you haven't found a way to apply it, you're not alone. There are a lot of people out there who have not really found utility for AI. And even for those who have, there's a defensive aspect to it, which creates a tension when you're bringing it into work and not necessarily feeling confident about what you're doing or why. At the same time, it's not all hype. There's genuine utility in applying these tools, but there's still a lot of hype. So what I want to talk about today are the use cases and best practices that actually work for design and research when it comes to using AI in your craft. All of this comes directly from a talk or from a research project I conducted over the last several months with subject matter experts and practitioners to understand what was actually going on. The space I like to inhabit in my research is really what I think of as the messy middle. It's finding the nuance and the complexities and bringing those to the foreground so that we can actually have a reasonable conversation about what is happening. The goal is really to identify real-world use cases, not the guy on Twitter who's like, oh my gosh, we're going to have ChatGPT generate the next Avengers movie, and then we're going to have Midjourney actually like uh, film it, and it's going to be like, we don't even need actors anymore. It's like, this talk is not that. If you want to see that talk, this might, not be, this might be a good time to go. This is about what we as designers and researchers and practitioners are actually doing and how we should be thinking about this tech. So I talked to 12 people and they spent a lot of time with me and I'm very grateful to them. Um, and it ranged all the way from junior ICs who had never, like this was their first role and they're trying to navigate how they apply AI to their craft where they've just gotten the job. All the way through people who are leading design and research practices and having to help their entire organization come to terms with this new technology and how to think about it. So I did these really in-depth interviews with all of these folks, and I focused on product design and UX research. And the reason I want to call that out is because AI-assisted content design looks very different. Design systems looks very different. And so the things that I am talking about today are not necessarily going to be fully relevant to every design function. With that, let's get into our handful of knots. These are the best practices that I was able to identify over the course of my research. Really, this is about thinking about how and where to apply AI and being realistic about your own abilities and the output. First and foremost, it's very important that we are all able to feel confident evaluating the accuracy and quality of the output. I think one of the things that happens with AI-assisted tools or even generative AI is that people get so caught up with the fact that they can make it do something that they're not really thinking about their audience. They're not thinking about what it actually looks like for the other people who are on the receiving end of that. They're just so excited that they can finally do this creative thing that they weren't able to do before. They don't really think about the impact of the output and their end users. So really, if you take nothing else away, take this. Don't use it if you can't evaluate it. The other thing that came up was this idea that inaccuracy is you know, not a huge problem if you yourself are an expert and can accurately evaluate the output. But the bias becomes a huge problem because of the opacity of these tools. It's 
it's very difficult to understand what training data went into what's coming out of this tool. And so having a plan for mitigating bias when you are applying these tools becomes increasingly important. Being aware that your data are the product. What you put into these tools potentially becomes a part of a training set. And thinking about the ethical implications and where and when you actually want to apply, provide these tools with data. And then staying realistic, right? Unlike our friend who is going to make the next Avengers movie, we, in this room, are going to think about AI as primarily assistive, something that can help take pattern, you know, repetitive work off our plates. I want to go in depth with some of these. First, don't use it if you can't evaluate it. This quote, I think, really gets at the heart of some of the problems, which is a lot of the output is pretty good. And then there will be this 10% of it that is really bad. And making sure that you're constantly evaluating and finding that 10% and correcting it. Accounting and correcting for bias. Being aware not just of the bias that you bring into this, but also not, not over-relying on a tool where you cannot understand which biases it's bringing in. I loved this quote from a researcher with whom I spoke, talking about our responsibility to our participants, our responsibility to the people who are providing us with information, right? Like, just because you have signed a consent form that says that we're gonna have a research conversation, you have not given me consent to put your data into a training model or to bring it into a large language model. So thinking clearly about our responsibility to our participants, to our users, to our companies, to everyone whose data we might be putting into these tools. And then thinking of AI as assistive, not generative. And I'll get into some of the use cases where generative AI actually does help with design and research, because they exist, and it's useful to acknowledge them. But this point, to me, really gets at the heart of what can be dangerous here, is that we get so caught up in the fact that we are able to generate something. We are not thinking about the impact on the end user of what we've generated. All of you in this audience are the only gate between what you have these tools produce and your end users. I want you to really take that responsibility seriously. I want to emphasize this again because this was such a critical part of everything. This came up with every single participant in the research, which like never happens. But the only use cases that actually work are the ones where you can evaluate the output. With all that, let's get into some actual uses, right? Like these are useful tools and we should talk about how we can use them and how we want to apply them. Because what this talk is actually about is about our responsibility and our opportunity as practitioners to set the terms on which these tools are used in our work. This is a moment of technological change and a tremendous shift in paradigm. And that presents not just opportunity and not just threat, but it presents responsibility to all of us to say, this is how these show up in our work, and this is how we will not use them. Collectively, we can make those decisions, and we can set those terms. But we have to do it collectively, and we have to do it thoughtfully. So with that, let's get into some of these use cases. What I think of as making stuff up, less great, <laughs> and then finding patterns, which is like when you think about what a computer is good for, finding patterns is really where they excel. Uh, a conversation I frequently have with my dad when he's asking me about AI is, you know, how should I be thinking about this? And I was like, well, one of my problems is that we keep putting these natural language outputs on something that is not natural. 
And so it creates a false sense of confidence and empathy between the user and the large language model. You're like, well, it's speaking to me in my language, and so we must be communicating. You are not communicating. The AI does not understand you, and it cannot imbue meaning. And that is a source of tremendous power, but we always have to be mindful of that. So generative use cases. I talked to some folks who are doing some really interesting things here. I talked to a product designer who is using this to code Figma plugins. He's saying, OK, chat GPT, I found this model of a Figma plugin. I don't know how to code, but I know how to debug code. I know just enough, and I can Google just enough. And it's a closed loop. He kept referring to it as like this closed loop. And the closer the loop, the easier it is to evaluate. Solving the blank page problem. I don't think I'm the only one in this room who has had the problem of staring at a Google Doc or a blank sheet of paper and just, what was my goal again? What are we doing here? How do I write an interview guide? I've been writing interview guides for 10 years, and every time I sit down to write one, it is like I have literally never done it before in my life. So we have tools for that now. That's fantastic. I don't know how many of you in this audience are researchers, but I will bet some of you have also come into this situation where you've got stakeholders, and your stakeholders are like toddlers in that they're very susceptible to shiny objects and bright abstract images. Uh, and so you're like, <laughs> I see someone nodding. Yes, exactly. You're like, I'm going to generate a report cover. It's going to make no sense, but it's going to pop. And then you've got their attention. And then proposing survey questions, right? Like, there are millions of surveys in the world. Please go find me all of the survey questions that someone with this study goal has asked before. So we've got some generative use cases. And then we really get into the meat of this with assistive use cases. Grammar and wording suggestions. This came up over and over again with my participants who were non-native English speakers, but who were transacting in English. This is ChatGPT has been unbelievably valuable for them in helping them communicate more effectively and feeling more confident in their ability to work with people of all different backgrounds. Transcribing interviews. This isn't new. This isn't like ChatGPT just started to be able to do this. You, we've been generating transcripts from interviews for so long based on AI. And they're like, yeah, they need corrections, but it gets you most of the way there compared to the 15 hours I used to spend transcribing audio for every research project. Theme finding across multiple interviews, summarization, like all of these pattern recognition problems where we let the AI be the most computer computer. We're not trying to make the computer human. We are trying to make the computer a better computer. I think that is a useful model for thinking about AI. It's like, I want you to be the, your best computer, and then I want you to talk to me like I am a human. That's really what AI does. Translation, another huge use case where you want to get your output in a language that's different from the input. And then suggesting an outline or structure, right? Like, we've been writing five paragraph essays for a long time. I would just like you to hit those bullet points for me. So I want you to leave this talk with a realistic view of what AI is and isn't, and what it is good for, and what it is not. But most importantly, I want you to leave this talk feeling empowered and inspired to set the best practices and use cases for your organization, for yourself, for your teams. Because this is a moment where collectively, we have a lot of power if we just leverage it. I want to end by thanking my research participants. This would not have been possible without all of these amazing people and their experiences. I want to thank Lauren Andrus, my content partner from Figma, who made this talk much better than it was <laughs> when I first started drafting it. I want to thank all of you for attending and for your thoughtful listening. I want to thank Figma for having me. Thank you so much for your time and attention.
That was awesome. I love that you were so honest with us at the beginning, letting us know that you're not actually that into AI. <laughs> Sometimes it can feel like it's so huge right now that if you're not using it, you're doing it wrong. But this is a really great reminder that some healthy skepticism can be good for us. And more importantly, that knowing the right way to, do, uh, to use it is key for it to be most effective. AI can feel really uncomfortable sometimes, and I feel like this has been very anxiety-reducing. And actually, speaking of, that's a perfect transition into our next talk. We are keeping these Zen vibes coming with our next speaker, Catherine Gonzalez, coming to us today with her talk about anxiety, AI, and where we go. Catherine was the head of design infrastructure, first designer and UI engineer at DoorDash, and I can't wait to hear you all uh, to, to wait, sorry. And I can't wait to hear for you all, hear her perspective. Everyone, welcome Catherine Gonzalez to the, sta to the stage. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Catherine Gonzalez, and I was most recently the head of design infrastructure at DoorDash, where I led our design systems designers, engineers, prototypers, and all the folks that took care of accessibility. I was there for eight years after starting as a first designer and front engineer, and now I'm taking a break to rest and travel and figure out what I want to do next in my career. So before I get into it, I just want to say this talk is a little different than what I've done before. It's a little more exploratory, a little more feely, and a little uncertain. I hope you like it. Right now, we're in a weird period of time. We all know someone that's been laid off, if not laid off ourselves. We have this wave of generative AI that's getting good enough to incorporate into our workflows. I'm sure many of you have used something like ChatGPT to generate some React components, or something like Midjourney to generate images or design assets. This is what Midjourney thought I was going to look like up here on stage today. It didn't get it quite right. <laughs> All at the same time, we've had an anxiety that has waxed and waned since the pandemic. We're all a little tired, and we're searching for optimism in what we do as designers and engineers in this industry right now. And thankfully, there already is optimism out there. As I was putting together this talk, Figma shared this insight from all the talk proposals they got for the conference this year. TLDR, the robots should be more worried about doing all the work that we don't want to do, that takes up too much of our time today, versus us being worried about them. With understanding and the right framing, optimism for how AI can help versus harm us is already out there. And I want this talk to provide more of it. But before we get to what I think can be the source of that talk, I want to talk about a similar time in our industry and what we can learn from it. Now, imagine it's 2007, and you're here. And you're a designer or a web developer. You don't know how much things are going to change as this comes along. The iPhone changed a lot for software builders. We've all worked on things that come because of what changed in that moment. The whole world changed, and we all followed, because there was such a big opportunity to shape how we could use this technology to build experiences for the billions of people we could now build for. And importantly, many of you had an opportunity in shaping the practices that came from the last decade and of that change, including the entire field of design systems itself. And all of these practices had champions and leaders that helped make them as prominent in how we think as they are today. Now is a similar time of change. The technology that we have in its early stages, generative AI, it's not going to go away. It's here to stay. And even though how it gets used and how it gets regulated, all of that still remains to be seen over the next few years. But importantly for this audience, we all have a part in shaping that future for design and design systems. And for me, there's a particular version of that future that I care to see. A few years ago, Daniel Eden, a designer at Meta, gave a talk at Clarity Conference called Where We Can Go. He said, critically, a design system is about people. It's made by people, used by people, 
and experienced by people. It's challenged and shaped and broken by people. In short, design systems work at its core is people-centered, and everything that we build for is for the people we support. As we move forward into this AI-focused future, it's a point I want to re-emphasize. How do we build systems and tools that focus on empowering people and the orgs that they live in, rather than just replacing their work? And with that, it begs the question, what exactly do we want the future to look like for the people that we're building for? Because at the end of the day, no matter how many layers of abstraction or AI, all of what we build is for the people on the other side, the fellow makers that we support with systems and the people that they're building for. I'd rather figure out how to get to a future that recognizes this rather than one that doesn't consider the people that we're ultimately building for in the end of the day. So for the last couple of months, I've been learning a lot from others, folks that are building side projects, startups, and applying their understanding of how AI can be used in design. And based on all that, I want to talk about a few predictions focused around this core question. What do people empowering AI-driven design systems and tools look like? There's three core themes in answering this that I want to focus on. First, we can reduce the busy work that we have to do and do the work that is meaningful and creatively stimulating and challenging that we want to do. Second, we can build tools that help augment our creativity and help designers think more broadly and explore more fluidly. And third, we can leverage AI to expand our skill sets, helping bridge the gap between our taste and our intentions and our ability to actually put it out into the world. Let's dive into each and show what I mean. For us, I want to focus on how we can empower design systems practitioners to do less of the work that's really tedious and non-differentiated in favor of the work that's actually valuable to the designers and engineers that you know, we're building these things for, right? I have a simplified model of the process of building a product to help illustrate my point. Over the course of building something, you come into it with an intention, usually to solve a very particular problem. You go through all the work of actually making it happen, the baseline execution. This is where all the busy work is, but some of the meaningful decisions are made, and you get that 80% done. For system builders, it's a lot of this stuff. It's managing tokens. It's keeping themes in sync. It's maintaining the system and migrating it. It's reviewing the usage of how people are actually using it, and then answering some support chat about it. These are all the things that today are tedious and manual and aren't necessarily focusing on the higher level problems that we're trying to solve with design systems. What if we could make more space for magic, the work that actually makes a difference, that helps elevate what we're doing as design systems practitioners? The magic comes from going the extra distance on polishing a part of your system that will help designers truly trust it, on making system-wide strides on important areas like accessibility, and on defining how we make decisions across the system. In many ways, it's these higher-level challenges that are focused on wrangling people and managing scale that are key to making systems work valuable. So what does this look like in practice? Let's take managing support and answering questions about the design system as an example. With a large language model trained on your docs, you can have your designers or engineers prompt it with questions, and it can respond with the insights from your docs in a conversational and natural way. This can feel like just a more advanced search interface, but with the right training and all the information that your design system contains, it can replicate a lot of what a design system maintainer would have said themselves in office hours or support chat. This is all work that I know maintainers often find themselves overwhelmed with today. And this tool can help us not just respond with our existing documentation, but can help uh, identify the gaps in it and then assist us in generating documentation to fill it. We can close the loop on these gaps in our documentation faster and more seamlessly. 
will have faster iteration cycles that cut out the busy work in answering support, writing documentation, and figuring out what to do next. And with that time now freed up, we can ask ourselves, how do we use that time wisely? Can we do a deeper improvement to the design system to reduce the questions that we get about a certain piece of it? Can we build tools that help train our AI to provide more relevant and timely insight? Can we write better documentation, focus on the most important pieces of our design system so that we can focus our time as people on the most important parts of the docs that are missing? These are the things that we can focus on when more of the work that can be automated away is automated. More opportunity for higher leverage magic and work and less of the busy work that we don't want to do. One of the things I've always found untrue about design systems is the criticism that they reduce the level of creativity that designers can have. I'm sure many of you have heard that one before, right? Great design systems, though, built by practitioners that care about the people they're building for, don't intend to limit what great designers can do. They're meant to bolster them through giving them resources, the flexibility to adapt the system, and the freedom to contribute their great ideas for everyone else to use in their organization. I see AI-powered tools and the systems that they leverage helping continue to increase creativity in designers rather than limit it. And to get there, I want to show you some of the things that are possible today. And I promise I didn't get a chance to see Noah and the diagram team's keynote earlier this morning, because this might look very familiar. One of the AI and design ideas I've seen so far is this idea of prompt to design. We're now able to write a text prompt to take a description of what you're trying to achieve, and then have the tool generate screens, components, flows, all based on your design system. And as people have said, there's a lot of opportunity to help bootstrap someone's process with this. Rather than starting from zero or using a pre-made and inflexible template, you can use this to, to quickly generate something closer to your intention and then build on that as a starting point. And another form of this is the idea of a copilot that operates as an autocomplete for your designs. Rather than being prompted explicitly, it takes all the context of what you've already made and what others have made in your organization and then predicts what should happen next. And interestingly, one of the core ideas of all these tools is that your design system serves as the language of how AI tools understand and consume your design. Rather than being something that goes away because of their level of structure and the ability for AI to work with them easily, design systems will be more important in the future, not less, because they will be the primary way we bridge the gap between AI and design and teach AI what we're trying to achieve. So now you're asking, what, what does this mean for augmenting creativity? Let me show you how these ideas can come together to help with that. So imagine a world where you're working in your design tool and you use embedded discussion and iteration with a copilot trained with your design system and design decisions. Sounds familiar, right? That copilot doesn't just provide you with one path forward, but it shows you different likely paths, one that it explains and justifies with its understanding of your design system and what values you want to emphasize in your approach. And you can respond to what it suggests, remix it with your feedback, and continue diving down different approaches to understand what's possible. It's like a choose your own adventure, but focus on design and based on all the context that you and your org have provided it. In this world, your tool knows your design system, not just providing the design assets for your UI for easy access, but one that understands the design decisions that your org has made, the components that it uses, the insights that come from user research and analysis, and can then leverage your decision frameworks to assist you. It can summarize those insights and surface them at the right time. It can push you to think about the opportunities in what you're designing. It can help expand rather than contract your thinking. And that's what I think AI tools have a unique opportunity to better solve. For now, they're not smart on their own, but they do have the right capabilities to make us smarter and more creative. 
That's a world where we're helping people do better work, empowering them with creativity and insight and the ability to execute on their choices faster and better. One of the things that's always drawn me to design systems is the fact that it's always felt like a comfortable home for generalists. And often as design systems practitioners, we've taken pride in that mentality that we take to our work, acting as designers, engineers, sometimes PMs, operational leaders to help solve the problems that we face. With AI, I think we're going to see a few things happen related to this mentality that is going to impact design systems. First, with AI, you're going to see a greater number of people that we work with already becoming generalists. You're going to see designers and engineers and PMs and other people involved in product building that previous, previously found a wall in between all those skills able to make more meaningful contributions across, across the whole product, uh, process. And as I showed earlier, you'll have people leveraging these AI-powered tools to contribute to design, and there will be a greater need to design our systems to support them. And you'll see more people contributing directly to our code bases as well. Large language models are pretty good at writing and reviewing code. Tools like GitHub Copilot, ChatGPT, Replit's Ghostwriter, or Code Sandbox's Boxy shown here make it much easier to navigate and contribute directly to a product through its code base. And you'll see more people be able to use tools like Bifrost to translate what they designed to code in a way that was just not good enough before AI. We'll have much more capable translations and code exports in a way that is considerate of your code base you already have, including your design system, all in Figma's dev mode, I'm sure. While the big decisions around architecture and technical approach will be left to the experts, more and more people will contribute around the edges of a design system. How do we as design systems practitioners make it easier for others to contribute to a system that already exists? And ultimately, I think the world that we build our design systems for will be bigger. Not just having colleagues with different skill sets more able to contribute, but more people entering the field altogether. More people will design and code because the skills necessary to build digital products are going to be more accessible than ever. The difficulty to become a builder will become less steep with AI-powered tools and education. And in that world, these people will need systems and tools to support them. So what does it mean to build systems for a much broader range of people? There's a few ways I see ourselves providing value in that future. One of the ways that I've always seen design systems teams be successful is that they can help bring a structured approach to collecting, remixing, and sharing the best ideas and solutions across a design org and outside of it. They use their taste, aka their critical judgment, and deep dom domain expertise in craft to help set the standards for what an org should try to achieve in the craft of UI engineering, or visual design, or operations, or at-scale decision-making. And our biggest responsibility will be to help build the systems and platforms for how others can leverage that taste. We're going to need to make our design systems robust enough for AI to understand and use effectively, while considering how everyone, designers, engineers, PMs, and otherwise, can come to the table to design and build with tools that use that AI. That will be one of the big questions for us system practitioners in the near future. How do we use AI and what we teach it to help elevate the work of so many others, both old and new, to design and building? That was a lot, but what I learned over the course of making this talk got me motivated to help bring these ideas into the world through my work or others. But those are just my ideas of the future. And maybe they can help you consider for yourself what you want to see. The truth is we're really early in figuring out AI. And there's a lot of uncertainty, even for people close to the progress being made. For our community, we don't even have many tools and systems that leverage AI well today. We're basically at the first part of this loading bar. And how long it can take and what awaits us on the other side beyond the next few years Pretty uncertain. But the part that gives me comfort 
is that this uncertainty, it can be empowering rather than paralyzing. Part of my opt optimism is the realization that this uncertainty in the future comes with an opportunity to shape it. We all, as people already in this industry practicing design or engineering, have an opportunity to shape what AI-powered design and systems work can look like. We can let an uncertain future happen to us by neglecting to provide our voice and our actions to that future, or we can take our principles and what we believe in and imbue that into that future. And to prepare ourselves to shape that future, I want to leave you with three actions that you can take for yourself. First, you can advocate for yourself or others to explore AI. To be able to shape the future, we need the time and the space to understand it. Acting as a leader for yourself or others to make that space is key. Second, you can focus on learning what this technology is, what it can or can't do, and turn it from something mysterious to something that is real and tangible. Play around with creating some mesh gradients with Midjourney, or go use ChatGPT to create some React components. Figure out how these tools can be incorporated into your workflow and where they can provide value. And finally, share what you learn and help bring people along. Go write articles that explain how you can incorporate AI into your work to generate all the tokens. Create and share open source tools that leverage AI. Be a driver and a participant in helping bring the rest of our community along into this future. Ultimately, systems and tools are only what we use them for. If we want an AI-driven future where they're empowering rather than harmful, we have to understand the technology and do the hard work to integrate it into what we do as a design systems community. That's the future I want and why I want to keep figuring out how to participate in what we're all building. And I want to leave you with this question for yourself. What version of the future do you want for design and design systems? And how do you want to participate in shaping it? I believe that you'll get there with curiosity and optimism that fuels you. Thank you. I want to say thank you to all the folks on the screen. Um.